Hello, thank you for tuning in to today's episode of Career Conversations. My name is Unika Walcott, and today's guest is Tom Ives. Tom Ives is a senior data scientist at Echo Global Logistics and the founder of Integrated Machine Learning and AI. And he's going to talk to us today about his career journey through this whole process. So, Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Very great to be with you. I wanted to start off by saying, when you tell your family that you're a founder of machine learning and AI company and a data scientist, what do they think you do? So for the founder of integrated machine learning and AI, they're well acquainted with that because uh, they saw me uh, start that up the fall of 2018. I was just trying to fill holes in the space and I had no online presence. So. It was my attempt to build a better online presence for what I was passionate to do. But uh, my wife likes to tell our friends when they ask her, or at her friends, when they ask her, what does Tom do? She just says, it's kind of like Chandler on Friends. What's hilarious is we finally found out that Chandler was a data scientist. <laughs> so oh, wow. that's, that's what's funny. But um, yeah, it's oftentimes it's hard for lay people to understand, hey, we're just applying scientific methods to data because there's a huge amount of data and it's growing very fast in the world. Okay. So usually they accept that answer pretty well. well. That's helpful. Could you tell me a little bit more about what a day in the life looks like for you? Oh, it's, it's very much not like what you would see in these data science boot camps, but I'm not putting those down. For example, if you have really good skills that you've gained from Udemy courses on data science and um, doing Kaggle competitions and everything, those things prepare you pretty well, but you still get things thrown at you from all different directions. So, you know, unique types of dirty data, unique types of getting to the data, and even if you're working with a great IT group, there's still battles. Not, not so much with the IT group, but with the policies and making them more reasonable. Because, for example, one thing I'm telling my current IT group at Echo Global, which is a great IT group, but I just said, you have to treat us not like the 2,000 salespeople on the floor, but like tr a trusted subgroup of IT. Otherwise, we're going to keep getting frustrated and they're starting to accept that and really kind of welcome us in as almost a subgroup of IT. Um, but it's amazing. Recently I had to learn something completely new just to accomplish task, which was constrained linear optimization. And I li literally had never had an opportunity to learn that. And it was also with integer programming. But thank God for years of practicing ways to learn better because I gathered materials, started studying, made sure I had plenty of different materials and was able to apply it to my problem very quickly. Okay. So, but the, it, it ba basically, there's needs that arise. And we have very smart management for data okay. science at my company. And so, there's always this great play. They, they know it takes us time and research to develop things. So it, it's a lot of uh, discussion with our leadership and with our internal customers to figure out how we can serve their analytical needs really well. I hope that answered the question. That one gets me excited. Well, I think that it's, it sounds like there's a lot of a lot of studying involved, but you've got a really good team of people that are open to like allowing you the space to kind of like learn new skills. Maybe it's something you came across early in your career, but never really had to use to solve a problem. What kind of problems are you solving? I know you mentioned dirty data earlier. I have no idea what that means. Oh, dirty data is a really common problem for data scientists because they have to first get the data. And then there's several things that have to be done traditionally to data before you can do any predictive analysis with it. So first of all, let me just give some examples of dirty data. It okay. might just be 
that you had a column of numbers from a SQL table, but someone didn't put the controls to make sure that's always a number, and maybe it got entered as a string, or maybe it was a missing value. And you have to decide, how am I going to replace that missing value, or how am I going to deal with it? Um, then, the, the, and there's several things you have to do to condition data to get it ready for any analysis you might do. A very important one would be scaling the data so that all the numbers are on the same rough numerical level so that one doesn't overshadow the other when you're starting to look at correlation strengths, things like that. Okay, so when you say getting all the, the numbers on the same level, are you meaning like if things are measured in thousands versus millions, kind of scaling in that way? Is that what you mean? Yeah, that can, and it can make a real big difference. For example, let's say you're just doing basic linear regression. Well, mm -hmm. a very valuable piece of information in that analysis is the coefficients, how big they are. Well, if you don't scale the features, you're just going to have coefficients adjusting according to those numerical ranges. But if you get the numerical ranges approximately the same, now that information on the coefficients is a very big deal. And to me, if I were the business leader and, and was talking to my data scientists, I'd say, I don't care if you ended up with a deep learning model. I want to see the coefficients you would get from a linear regression model so I get a feel for the feature weights, how important the features are. And then that we could go on beyond that. Okay. I so, love talking about the mathematical theory stuff. Okay. So uh, and I'm trying to grasp this so that people who are not in the space like can understand better like exactly what you mean. You talk about kind of grasping the um, the weight of the of the coefficients, how they factor into the data outcomes and the information that you get from your analysis. So let me give you a simple example here. Okay. okay. So let's say there's uh, one feature that's uh, X. Uh, we can make up another term, but I'm going to say it's feature X. Okay. And then we've got feature Y, and we want to see how they correlate. Okay. Well, if we plot them against one another, if they kind of form a line roughly, well, now we can use mathematical techniques to pass a line through those okay. data points. And, and so now we have the equation of a line. Well, I hope everyone will remember, and it's okay if you don't, but y equals, the, or the output equals the slope times the x variable plus the y-intercept. Well, that slope value tells you that relation between x and y, and that's what I mean by a coefficient. But now imagine there's multiple features relating to one output feature that we really care about. We're trying to predict through correlation how this one variable, yeah. And so those various slopes for each relation between this feature to the output feature and this input feature to the output feature, those slopes, so to speak, coefficients, they tell us a lot about the process we're looking at. Now, this is really helpful. I think it kind of just took me back to like algebra one, like y equals mx plus. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think I, I follow much more clearly where you're going. I, I don't want to give people a math lesson, but I want people to kind of have a better context for like what it is you do. Uh, so thank you for, for that really simple example. Um, yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about why, why did you choose a career in data science? So when I was uh, an undergrad, there was no such thing as data science. And I had grown up just loving building things in my garage. I found uh, biology very easy in high school and physics and trick very challenging. So of course, I chose the more challenging route. And I remember being very encouraged when my physics teacher in high school asked me, what are you gonna do in college? I said, I wanna study mechanical engineering. And he said, you'll do well. So, you know, with that background of passion of loving to build things and think about how to build them so they worked well, and that love for analysis like physics and trig, I, I went off and I got to tell you, my first two years were hard. I, yeah. I felt quite confused. Yeah, Dr. Ives was not always, you know, 
an intellectual heavyweight with predictive modeling, but something clicked around my junior year. And all of a sudden dynamics and statics and differential equations, it all came together for me, even to where in my senior design project, I was using the differential equations that describe the physics of the system we were designing to predict how it would behave before we built it. And I just thought that was so powerful. It, it made me feel like it was worth it to grunt through all the hard work of trying to understand the math and the physics and how it related. But what's interesting is even in my freshman year, I was doing data science. A, a lot of times, most of the time, we prefer to use physics to do predictive modeling in engineering. But sometimes the system's too complicated and we use what's called empirical modeling. Well, that is very much like what we do in data science. And there's other thing types of math we would do. So when people say, why do you why did you decide to switch to data science? I have this internal reaction like an old man, son, I was doing linear least squares regression by hand, you know, before you were born. <laughs> And right that, before there was software, you could kind of run things through and, and get the outputs. <laughs> and we, we had good software in the fan, in the form of Fortran that we were running on mainframe servers. But the, the interesting thing is, even when I was in grad school and coding neural networks from scratch, uh, fuzzy logic systems, um, expert systems, programming those artificial intelligence, we weren't calling it AI or data science or deep hmm. learning, even though I was doing those things. When Jan LeCun, he, we're about the same age, when he was working on networks in high school, um, we didn't call any of that data science. We did call it the networks. Yeah. You're breaking up just a smidge. Could you repeat that for me? Well, I was just saying, Really, we had those terms of uh, fuzzy logic, neural networks, etc. But we hadn't coined the phrase data science yet. I'm not even sure we were saying artificial intelligence. If we did, it wasn't very often. Now that makes sense. So, so artificial intelligence and data science are new terms, but the technology is not new. Correct. Um, the the first name for a neural network was a perceptron, perceptron network. I might be butchering that a little bit, but um, it, it, was a, it wasn't a it was a brand new art, but it, it was definitely new. And I, I like to help people understand, we are new in this data age. Um, a good way to kind of lay out what we're going through is to watch that movie called The Current Wars about Thomas Edison, Nikolai Tesla, George Westinghouse. If you look at what was going on in that movie, we're very much in the early stages of the data age now, not the electric age. So similarities to be sure. It's exciting to be on the forefront of something that's gonna be so transformative to society. Agreed. I, I, could, I could imagine that's what, what keeps you going. You mentioned your college experience. Um, what kind of skills and background does someone need to to be able to to um, maybe perhaps transition into to the field of data science? Sure, um, I, I am a firm believer that someone can do it without even going to college. It will be harder because you have the burden of proof now, uh, or a, a larger burden of proof. Even someone that's going through the college route, for example they still need to have an online portfolio. They need to demonstrate their work. Get people, employers that are looking for people, they need to be able to see what you've done. But um, when you, you have to kind of decide, by the way, data science is not only huge, no one person can know all of it, but right. it's accelerating. And so I, I try to coach people, none of us are gonna be able to keep up with it perfectly and this is uh, the first point to answer your question. Focus on the concepts. If you master the concepts, then the math falls into place better. What computation you need falls into place better. What language 
uh, computer-wise or programming-wise you might use will fall into place better. And there's always options, but even with the math, you can't just go learn all math. You learn the math that serves your needs best in data science. So you name the big one. Uh, anyone that wants to be really good in data science really needs to just be really solid with algebra. Good old basic algebra one and algebra two. Geometry is not going to hurt. At least some good amount of linear algebra at least the ability to go review it quickly in other words um right. to be able to go okay i think i need to brush up on this and and move forward it's sort of similar to how you mentioned earlier you went to go brush up on was it linear computations um oh it was uh, <laughs> constrained linear optimization with integer programming too is very okay. very very different yeah, from what very, i said <laughs> very heavy. Yeah, no, it's, I don't blame you at all. And, uh, but let's say someone wanted to get really good at neural networks, deep learning, transformers. Well, it, it's, a, it's a fair amount of linear algebra, but not a ton. It's a little bit of calculus, but not, not the amount of calculus that a, um, well, a multi-physics engineer, which is my other hat that I wear, you know, you don't have to know calculus that well, like to, at the differential equation level. Now, would okay. it possibly help if you were a researcher? Absolutely. But if you're trying to be a really good practitioner, hey, yeah, you probably want to know a little bit of calculus, a fair amount of linear algebra, be really good with algebra, and then be good at knowing how to program. But oftentimes, you're just going to use tools that other smart programmers made. Okay. No, that, that makes sense. So it sounds like a lot of this requires you to be obviously basic, al you know, beyond basic algebra, reasonable understanding right. of calculus, and really just have an attitude of like continuous learning. It sounds like that's really the, the thing yes. that keeps everything together here is you have to realize like that you're never done learning in this industry. That is perfectly stated, in fact. And, and I also try to encourage people Yes, you'll have your books, you'll have your articles, you'll have them linked, but take really good notes that refer to those in key places and have those notes in the cloud where you can get to them instantly. I would have given one of my fingers when I was a young man to have the cloud to store my notes in. Uh, it, it just huge I've never advantage. Thought about that. Someone who took notes like mostly by hand in college and like my method was like, I'm going to color code these and you maybe scan them someplace, but there's no cloud to stick them in. <laughs> I own a, a lifetime uh, two terabyte cloud drive. I am an avid user of GitHub, GitLab, DAGS Hub, all of those. I take very careful notes because I don't. I, li I don't mind relearning things. I just don't want it to take very long. So if I take very careful notes of what I'm currently learning, it's e or, or even keep very good records of code experiments I've written and keep them in a very clear directory structure, I can refer back to those very quickly. So I don't know if you've ever heard of Stack Overflow. It's a very popular site for scientific programming and programming in general, but it it turned out over time, it couldn't answer all my questions, so I'd answer my own questions. And now I have this directory structure I call Tom Overflow. <laughs> and it, it, well, more and more, I refer back to my old code that experiments that I did, where I'm trying to get things to run faster with less memory, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, it, it, those notes that we take, um, especially in the cloud where we can get to them quickly, they can't be underrated. I, I never thought about the, the gift of keeping like the, the previous sort of problem solving of code sort of stored away to go, okay, break in case of emergency. Let me go back to this thing that I, I thought might work for this, but it may be better suited for the project that has come up later. I had not thought about that. That's kind of similar to how I, I treat my proposal process. It's like, okay, well, this may not be useful for this particular client effort, but the language is good in something else. Okay, so this is really cool parallels. <laughs> yeah, no, you're spot on with that. I agree with you. 
really, really cool parallel. So you talked about your college experience. You talked about the kind of knowledge that people need to obtain to get into this, this industry. What do you do for fun when you are programming and coding and solving major problems? So um, I've been an athlete most of my life. When I was growing up, I was a competitive swimmer. That was just the sport I picked. I probably should have done wrestling or speed skating or something like that. But I was growing up in Texas and it was hot. So swimming oh, was very appealing. The pool appealing. seems like a perfect place then. <laughs> exactly. And I did okay. But then um, over the years, I've done triathlons, um, a little bit of bodybuilding, um, just trying to stay in shape, martial arts. And lately, um, I got my new proud thing here. Let's see if I can unclip it here. This is my new uh, weight belt. For um, So I'm powerlifting, and it works out great because some of my closest friends on LinkedIn and my new manager, whom I really like a lot he's a power lifter but they're more experienced than me but i i realized at my age long term this was going to be able to keep my strength up keep me healthier and so i'm really enjoying that now and it it's I, maybe i'll compete but i care more about my prs my personal records than oh, well that, that is really important and you say prs and it makes me think of one of my previous guests she's a, a world record holder um strong woman <laughs> awesome oh, i'd love to get to know her yeah, but then, I, I can um, make that introduction for you. I no love problem. that. Perfect. Yeah. But yeah, no, but I love cool. to watch. I love to watch shows with my kids, and out this way from my, I'm sitting next to a window, and I've got a big shop out in the back of my backyard, and I'm I'm eager to do more out there. But uh, I just love to build things still. And so yeah. you say you love to build things. What is something you've built that you're most proud of? Oh man, there's been a lot, but it, a lot of the building is in the data science realm, in the AI realm. And um, I'll, I'll just give, there's been so many things I'm very happy with. Um, for my PhD, I built a, a suite of models, modules, model modules, by which I could put together different virtual hybrid electric power plants. So, um, Probably 25 years after I completed my dissertation, I finally bought a hybrid vehicle. And it was like being a kid all over again because I remembered all the research, all the simulations, and I'm like, this thing is awesome. And, and uh, it totally changed my driving habits because I, I have this game I play with myself of trying to get the highest gas mileage out of my Prius I possibly can. But I just... <laughs> I, I love doing predictive modeling and getting really accurate results. That that gets me very excited. And recently, I was pushing myself to be able to deliver my models uh, through web APIs or through a web app. Because to me, that's the future. We really, data scientists need that skill. Well, there's this new group called Streamlit that's just made that stupid easy for us like if you know and love python which is my primary programming language you can deliver a web app really easily now because of this amazing team that's built this new uh python module called streamlit and they're being supported by really huge famous companies and i i i almost i i was going down a route where i was doing it the hard way with a JavaScript libraries and and uh, uh, fast API, which fast API is a great tool when you use it right. But uh, just in some of my research, I realized, oh, that looks promising. I better take a break and go study that. To make a long story short, within 24 hours, I had my whole app built, which was taking me weeks before that. So. The tools keep getting better and better. Wait, you went from <clears throat> weeks to like a day. Yeah. I've been working weeks to master certain JavaScript libraries that I didn't have much uh, skill with and, and trying to do things with some of their things. And then I came across this group that said, 
data scientists don't need to be learning that. They need to just use Python like they always do to do. And it's not as flexible. But right. when you use it and you see how nice of an application you create, you're like, hell, I don't care. This is awesome. Because <laughs> it took me an hour versus week. Now, I'm not trying to put down, um, <clears throat> you know, React and Vue, these great JavaScript libraries and these other frameworks that we use to release web apps or huge websites because they have amazing flexibility and capabilities. But just for a data scientist that wants to create a dashboard and they're, they're Pythonistas, they're, they love Python and they've got to get a web app out to end users, Streamlets, awesome. And you know, we, we could have a whole show just on the amazing tools that have been coming yeah, out. Yeah, no, I'm there. excited just like learning about all this. This is kind of a whole new world for me in a lot of ways. And it sounds like what you're kind of saying is like this stream list, is it? Um, is really list. Kind of oh, it's a stream L I T. Oh, That's stream list. Oh, okay. Um, so this particular software, like you said, it, it's kind of expedites processes, but it doesn't have the same flexibility as the other tools. It's more high level and you're, you're literally just using the Python programming language to direct elements on a web page where you maybe upload a data file, then run the model using that input data, and then it pre creates an output file and your end users can download those outputs and boom, I've delivered a web. Now, by the way, the R programming language, which is also amazing, um, they have a thing called R Shiny and it can release apps too. From what I'm seeing, the streamlet's a little easier to use, but then it's newer using more advanced tools. The, the R community is amazing too, by the way. <clears throat> a lot right. of data scientists use R, but more uh, use Python. Usually people that have come from certain branches of mathematics and statistics and certain research, they'll lean toward R. People that just want more like the Swiss Army knife of programming, they'll lead, lean toward Python, but they're both awesome languages. And there's another big player on the horizon that might take over both of them, I don't know, Julia. Haven't had time to learn it, but it's growing in popularity. Okay. So how do you keep up with all of the new technology and the latest sort of sources? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. That you read or? My, my water cooler now. Uh, so in case people don't know, this is my living room, but I have more interaction with people because of COVID now, because it forced me online and I started making tons of friends online. People started reaching out to me for mentoring, which was a blessing because I really wanted to be a mentor. And, um, but now it, it's like drinking from a social fire hydrant. There's all these <laughs> wonderful people that I work with, and I can't say that I keep up with anything, but I keep up with it a lot better than I used to, let's put it that way. I mean, the way that it sounds like the the tools and the, the resources that are available progress, there's no way to actually keep up with anything, but it sounds like in like a real little like time, you know, real time sort of scenario, but it sounds like you're doing an amazing job. You've got a lot of mentees, it sounds like, that plenty of opportunities online to, to get to know people. Um, as far as people who are interested in, in having you as a mentor, is that something you're open to or, or how would they connect oh. with you? In fact, uh, most people that find out about me, they'll reach out to me directly on LinkedIn and ask either, hey, can you mentor me? Or, or they already know about our community, which I offer them to say, look, yeah, I will do everything I can to help you, but it'd be better if you joined our community where a lot of other people will also want to help you and be helped by you because I know the new people struggle to see this, but they're going to, if they're consistent and pace themselves, it's going to be about a year or two where they're going to know some stuff that none of the rest of us know, and they're going to be quite capable of helping us. And so that was the real spirit of the community. We call it more together. And the community is the integrated machine learning and AI. But I want to emphasize something before we go on. And it's this. 
if you focus on those concepts and you focus on constantly improving your learning skills, like don't think of becoming a master learner. Think of always being a student of how to learn better and you'll, yeah. you'll go far better. And so if you're focused on mastering concepts, seeing the way certain concepts cross many realms and then having a way to learn and take really good notes over time, the world's your oyster then. It's not so much about keeping up with things. It's, hey, awesome. I get to learn this cool new thing now because I need to learn it for what I do. Okay. Now, this, this sounds like a, a space that we find. I know I am kind of a learning junkie. That's part of why I enjoy doing career conversations. I get to meet different people, learn about different career paths and personalities and just so many different things. Um, what did you want to become when you, or, or do when you grow up? Oh, that's perfect. An inventor. Oh yeah. And that's still what I want to be, but I get to do that almost every day. If you think about really, when I talked about my shop, th there's a big idea I've been working on for more than two decades and it, it has grown and improved over those two decades, but eventually I'll build up my shop more with specialized tools. But if you think about, well, what do you do now, Tom? Well, I have a virtual shop with specialized tools where I get to invent things for a wonderful company and a wonderful culture and a wonderful business for our country. Okay. So you are really preparing for your magnus opus. Yes. That's exactly right. <laughs> you so know, that's, what so was nice like... is not. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add. It took me a while, but to realize, hey, a PhD is not an end. It is a big beginning. And I've had to, re you know, just keep reemphasizing to myself. You're a philosopher. Push the damn envelope. And and so it's not always, though, I. I'm not Jeffrey Hinton and I'm not Jan LeCun or Richard Sutton. These are fathers of major areas of data science, by the way, artificial intelligence. But you know what? I'm still Tom Ives. I still have a lot to give, but why don't I improve this system along the way? And while I'm doing that, invite others to explore ways so that we can grow more together. In other words, so we can have a better philosophy about how we learn, how we do our work, how we conduct our lives even. <clears throat> so that we can be better inventors, of course. <laughs> That's exciting. So was there a particular moment that like sparked your interest in becoming an inventor or, or an event? You know, I think I was born with it because I, I didn't realize how weird I was until... <laughs> I was like in my mid thirties, but by the, by the time I was three, I was picturing things 3d in my mind that I wanted to build. Wow. So this is, is really just such a deep and intrinsic part of who you are as a person. This was an inevitable, really is. inevitable for you to end up here. Um, you described a PhD mm -hmm. as a beginning rather than an end. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on that for me? You bet. Um, let's go back to the powerlifting analogy. Um, okay. You know, powerlifters that are in it for the love of the benefits of it, they get excited because they realize, hey, how much am I going to be able to lift? But also, if you're in an emergency situation that requires strength, you're going to be much better prepared. Well, what a PhD did was it put me under the scrutiny of other PhDs to say, do we believe this young man knows how to do research? That he could go do original research on his own? Do we approve of the way he proposed his research, conducted it, and presented it to us? Well, you know what? That's kind of like mental powerlifting. I am yes. I, back when I did that, I became stronger at knowing how to do, forgive me for saying it this way, but I'm just gonna borrow a phrase from my good buddy Ben Taylor knowing how to do cool shit. That's what <laughs> I it love comes it. Down to. 
I love it. No, that that is really exciting that you talk about the PhD kind of being like a mental power lift. Um, and being three, I just imagine a three-year-old met like envisioning like <clears throat> things you could build. Like that's extraordinary. Um, what advice would you give someone that's interested in becoming a data scientist? Like what would be like a step one? Uh, it's it, it, it's kind of hard to, there's, there's a group of characteristics I think that must be there. You've already named one of them very eloquently, by the way, which is that love of continual learning. But um, it's really easy to get burned out because it's a lifelong process. Mm. And so you have to have patience. In other words, you want to get to this level, but you're here. And you've got to be patient to say, okay, to get from here to here, I've got to learn this. And then I've got to learn that. But if I try to go to this before I really understood this well, I'm going to slow myself down. And so it takes patience. You've got to accept, hey, I'm learning math and other things that took thousands of years for humanity to develop. I need to be patient with myself learning this step. And once I understand the concepts and the methodologies of this step, then I can move carefully to this step and then to that step. And then I arrive here and you know what? Then you can do a legal power lift then, not a <laughs> cheating one and not one that will injure you mentally. You really developed yourself carefully. So that, but the, there's other benefits of taking it patient and carefully because the conceptual knowledge you develop along the way prepares you to have new insights when you, because you will encounter very tricky problems that no one's ever solved before. And this is something a lot of new data scientists don't appreciate. Yes, you do want to master those basics you're learning in school or grad school or in those boot camp courses. But you know what? You're going to encounter some weird shit. And you need to know how to push through and use your conceptual knowledge to and apply the math and the coding to get over the hump with that. Um, you know, sometimes you do, like, I, and I'm this is not a put down at all. Business analysts tend to do typical things, uh, and the, the, they still require a lot of, uh, of the fundamentals and a lot of good conceptual understanding, but certain roles really require pushing the boundaries on what we've done. There's that makes me think of someone who talked, uh, I talked to earlier this week who said, you know, as a writer, I, I try to coach people how to write and I want them to understand and learn the fundamentals so they know where to break things. And it's, it sounds like Perfect. that's that's where, where you're going here. You go, look, you have to master the concept so you know where to break it when, you, when you're faced with a unique sort of situation so that you know, okay, this is a worthwhile sort of adventure to try in this circumstance. Otherwise, you're kind of left to your own devices to go through a hundred things for no reason when maybe the weird thing that you tossed aside is the one that might be it. Exactly. <laughs> um, in senior design, the, this became very apparent. We saved all our ideas because you never knew when a better idea might be a hybrid between two or three parts, uh, excuse me, between parts from two or three failed ideas. You need to keep a record of all those ideas. And when I'm leading a group that's creative problem solving and there's someone that is putting down an idea, I very politely say, don't destroy our productivity by what you're doing right now. There may be an element in this current idea that will be a big win for us and you also need to actively figure out not just what's wrong with this idea, but how you can fix that wrong and make this idea workable so we get the most value out of it. So quit being that way or I'm going to kick you out of the group. <laughs> I like the idea that you've introduced the concept of fixing the wrong. I, I don't think people even begin to approach problems that way. They go, that doesn't work. What's next? You're saying, look, it's, there there are some elements that are good, and there's some elements that could probably use some adjustment. Let's explore it. And I got to give a lot of credit to a mentor of mine, 
whom I never met personally, but I read his books very carefully, Edward de Bono. He left yeah. this world recently, but super smart guy that invented the six thinking hats. But there's lots of people that have created good uh, creative problem solving tools to not, or, or to, to, how do I put this? There are some things in American culture that are not conducive to good thorough creative problem solving. And it's our job to identify those and politely fix them among, among our peers. Very well said. There are some things in our culture that, that are not that are not suited for, for innovation. <laughs> yes. Um, we we are horrible at debate, for example. Oh and goodness. If you, get a good, <laughs> if you get a good facilitator of the six thinking hats in a room where you've got a lot of smart people and you want to get the best out of all their minds, a good six hats facilitator can do that. It's, it's very powerful. Yeah, I've jotted that down, the six thinking hats. I'm like, this sounds like a book that would be beneficial even if you were not in data science. It sounds like it's a way to, to, to reframe how you break things. <laughs> I, I know after you read that book and you really think about it, you're going to want to send me a payment through PayPal, but no, I'm giving you this book. <laughs> well, you know, I know how to find you. <laughs> Um, so we've talked about kind of like what you wanted to do when you grow up, we talked about sort of the, the college process and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Is there anything that I've not asked that you'd like to share? You know, there is, okay. I'm still kind of figuring it out myself. <laughs> I had, I had a crisis about two years ago. And uh, I, I'm going to ask the viewers to be patient with me right now in general for the way I'm going to initially say this. Okay. But um, I was just in a place in my career and in a location where I had a lot of extra time to think. And I was able to look back on my life and, you know, I was mourning certain decisions I had made and many regrets I'd had. And it, it occurred to me, damn. I am so stupid, but so is everyone else around me. And I need to process this more, but that's not gonna come over very well. And so I started really thinking, what do you mean when you say that, Thomas? Well, okay, what is my human condition? I'm almost essentially completely blind and ignorant. And to complicate matters further, I'm also injured in my soul and corrupt and thank god in those four conditions i'm powerless but the question is how do i reduce those states as quickly as possible and i could only see one answer that said how to reduce them as quickly as possible but another answer to how to make them worse over time the way to make them worse is just to be arrogant and deny those states. Huh. But the way to make them better is to exercise extreme humility, where you're willing to learn from anyone and everything, and you're, you care more about learning and growth than you do about being right. That's one for me to sit with for sure. <laughs> I have an image of that that I could send to you, but it's nice because it's in 3D. Blindness and ignorance, corruption and injury, powerlessness or powerless. And then you get to, ch the only control you have is, are you going to be humble or are you going to be arrogant? And that affects those other states. Wow. It's, it's been amazing because uh, I remember when it was being formulated in me, I had to work with a guy that previously, like more than a decade previous to this, had been one of the nicest people I had ever worked with. New company, new role, I'm working with him again. I'm like, who stole my old friend and replaced him with this exact replica and made him a flaming asshole? <laughs> you know what? 
you know, Greca, he was so smart still. I still respected his intellect. And I thought, you know what? I can get really offended by the way he's acting because I see him treating others the same way. He was deeply injured. And so he was reacting from all that corporate American inj injury that he had felt. And he was, I agree, he was treated like crap and he didn't deserve it. Just outstanding intellect. But I thought, I can either learn from this guy and just kind of filter out the hypercriticality or I can whine and bitch and, you know, report him to HR all the time. Well, you know, quite a, one thing that was it's, cool. It's that unique. Happened, thank you. I, I kept worrying. I don't know how to pronounce it right, obviously. Thank you, Unica. He, um, there came a time where he looked at something I was presenting. He said, wait, how did you solve that? I said, oh, I just, I, it was hard. I had to try different routes and then I found this. Well, it was clear he had tried a few times and hadn't done it. But he didn't like to interact with me, but I'd still suck it up and say, hey, Gary, can I get your input on something? And it was painful because he was just hard to talk to now. But I would always get because he's so smart and I'd look at things he was presenting that he was getting shot down. And, no, he's thinking, right, I'll go study that some more on my own. Well, I grew a lot during that period. The sad thing in Mika <laughs> is that he did not. He did not benefit from me. And I, I feel sad to this day because there's so many things still I love about that guy. But <laughs> the injury. Him not being able to recognize, I've been injured. How do I deal with this? Well, with humility. This interview has been a gift to me. <laughs> and and I, I appreciate you sharing your, your journey through becoming Dr. Tom Ives and, and, and what it, it's been like in your career to kind of even just navigate difficult people, solve difficult problems. Like, I think a lot of times, like you said, like our culture doesn't lend itself to certain things. And I think one of those things that doesn't lend itself to very well is being comfortable with being uncomfortable and dealing with difficult things. It's hard because it, it is really hard to deal with injury, especially something from your childhood. You don't even necessarily know how to process it. Be humble enough to go get help. <laughs> Therapy is expensive. <laughs> And yet, there's a, I, I actually, there was a period I went through with a certain company. It was very dark, uh, very revealing of a lot of crap I had to deal with, but they had some free counseling. And I went, I think I'm going to take, I'm going to think I'm going to take advantage of that. Learn so much from the guy. In fact, toward the end of our sessions, he was like, Tom, we're learning a lot from each other now. I said, oh, wow, I'm honored you'd think that. But just, he... He was someone that was very humble, had realized I disavow much of my early career trying to help people. And then I stumbled on this one guy from Australia and it changed the way I went about counseling. And now I feel like I can make a difference. Because one session I said, what are you doing with me? I tried to, I almost dread coming here and then when I leave, I'm so happy, but I don't understand what's going on. He said, oh, let me explain. <laughs> and it was pretty cool. Wow. So you said, look, I keep coming back for the results. I don't necessarily enjoy the process. <laughs> I feel like that's like the difference between a good therapist and a so-so one. The good ones, you come back for the results, even if it's a wildly uncomfortable series of sessions. Well, when you think about it, you're sitting down with a stranger and you're going. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, shit. I, I went there. I said that. Why? Oh, because this is a counselor. <laughs> right, the, the things you'd never say in public and probably wouldn't even put in a journal. God forbid someone finds it. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I'm, I'm so grateful that you've come on Career Conversations, that you've talked about your journey. I think that it's even more impressive that you've talked about the, the impact of injury, which I think is something that a lot of people are not even willing to be vulnerable enough to, to you know, admit that that's part of our, a lot of our human condition. Like, I don't know anybody that has lived, you know, a day or two, honestly, that has not been injured in some form or fashion, but you're saying what we do with that matters. And, and we'd need more than an extra hour to deal with the corruption component, but I'll leave that between you and, and whatever 
spiritual beliefs you have. <laughs> that's <laughs> one that's probably not as comfortable a conversation with, uh, with you know, everyone in the public. But I think, you know, let's think back to one of our great mentors. All, all of us can take him on as a mentor through his famous student, Plato, and that's Socrates. Yes. And if you just take the one thing that we have recorded through Plato that he said, the unexamined life is not worth living. So, hey, start examining your life, but do it honestly. Let me, let me just give everyone a prediction. You're going to discover some crap that you don't like, but you won't be alone. You, you'll, <laughs> discover, you'll, just, you'll discover your crap, but trust me, there's other people that have crap, and it may be even far worse. But if you're at least humble enough to admit it, you can get somewhere with it. Excellent, excellent insight there. Like you said, willing to be able to examine ourselves honestly. You know, so, another point here though that I want to leave everyone with, if you if you come into the field of STEM or data specialization of any kind, you really are entering the realm of philosophy. But don't make the mistake of thinking that something you learned in algebra or data science or physics can't be abstracted conceptually and applied to other areas of your life, because it absolutely can. Uh, what helped me with my friend who had turned into an asshole was realizing I can apply a control system here. And a good control system rejects the disturbances and the noise and takes the true signal. Mm. And so I just kept listening to him and say, I'm going to take the true signal because I know I'm not perfect. He's just very harshly and rudely pointing out my mistakes. But you know what? I don't want to make those mistakes again. So I'll listen to him. But yeah, it was painful. <clears throat> but I got good feedback once I filtered it. <laughs> now, here's a question for you, Tom. I know, I know we're kind of wrapping up, but what role do you feel ethics plays in being a data scientist? I think ethics just plays a role in being human. Um, I, it, it became sad to me when ethics became an area that, oh yeah, we're humans. We need to kind of check in with each other to make sure we're not bending the line here. And, uh, I used to joke that, you know, I could have been a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer and I'd have no end of work because you can always count on people to ruin their health, their teeth and be immoral. But here <laughs> I am trying to affect change. You I'm know, sorry. This, this is harder here to get work and, and, uh, and to stay employed. But thank God for this emphasis on the data age because I'm having the time of my life. I'm just tickled that you can always count on people to ruin their teeth. <laughs> <laughs> their health, their teeth, and be immoral. <laughs> That's why we need ethics, is because we do have common corruption, unfortunately. We, yeah, very. Hey, very I, I'm not trying to say I'm all that righteous. I'm trying to say it really helps when I remain cognizant that I am corrupt. And I need to be on guard against it. And I think that's why it use, it, when ethics first came out, it's like, I don't want to learn this. I got all this physics and, and math and coding to, to stay sharp on. And, but it dawned on me over time. This is important stuff. We, we need to be talking about this. We do. Well, Tom, I've had an incredible time learning from you. I hope that my guests, I mean, excuse me, that my, my viewers um, really take away a lot of the really good insights that you brought, just not about the world of data science, but also just about ways to live life and be effective in your career and in building relationships. Because I, I think really at the heart of what you're talking about with kind of, you know, tuning out the noise and getting to the truth of things is like really having strong emotional intelligence. Oh, that, that's really well put. I own that book and I probably read a fourth of it, but I think I've lived 400% uh, of it, both the right way and the wrong way. 
I mean, if you don't get it wrong, you don't appreciate getting it right. At least this is my opinion in some, uh, some instances. I guess uh, we can fail fast in emotional intelligence, too, so we learn quicker. But it's painful socially along the way when we do. Yeah, you can lose a few good friends and opportunities. <laughs> I'm All just right. glad my wife hasn't left me. <laughs> I experiment on her more than anyone, but her, me too. <laughs> yeah, no, that like marriage is like target practice. <laughs> That's really well put. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds bad out loud, but. <laughs> hey, we've been real with each other, so yeah, it's okay. No, it's that you very much there. so. It's, it's saying, look, I trust you to operate in these parameters not to intentionally damage me. <laughs> Let, let's see how it goes, and maybe we'll make it 30 or 40 years. Yeah, very well put. All right, well, everyone, I so Thank appreciate you your time for having Tom me. With you. Um, if you guys want to get in touch with Tom, you can find him on LinkedIn. He is very responsive, very easy going, guys. You can see just kind of being a part of today's conversation. Um, until next time, love y'all, and 